Hello, I'm here to demonstrate how, how we're going to be doing things for our intubation teams. First of all, I'm going to get my yellow gown. You can see here, this is a three hole gown. It doesn't really matter which way it is, whether it's inside out or not, but this is the way it is designed at the seams out. I'm gonna put my hands through here and through the hole here. And you can see I'm gonna grab it and make sure I can put that on. And I'm gonna wanna make sure that I can get as much possible coverage of the neck area. Next pair of gloves I'm gonna put on is actually a pair of surgical gloves because especially for those of you that are taller, you're going to want to have something that has long enough cuffs. In an ideal circumstance, we would have uh, the extra long cuffed nitro gloves, but as of right now, this is probably our best option. So once you put that glove on, you've got a seal there with your gown. So this is my first pair of gloves, and now we're going to double glove. So I'm gonna grab my pair of nitro gloves as well to put on in addition. And of course, I've done hand hygiene before I started this entire process. So I have my bouffant cap on. I'm gonna want some eye protection. So I have some goggles that I'm going to put on right here like so. I'm also going to want my handy dandy N95 mask. And I'm going to put that on. It's probably better to put your mask on before your goggles. I'm gonna make sure that I've got a nice seal here. Checking for a leak, making sure that straps are nice and flat. And actually, in the interest of conservation, I'm gonna put a surgical mask for droplet protection on top of my N95. Now, the goggles are not entirely essential if you are wearing the splash uh, face shield as well, but as long as they don't fog, I think it's a nice addition. Face shield. You might consider using one like this if you wanted to, but it doesn't actually offer you protection here at the face level. So this here, these are going to be reusable. We are going to wipe them down afterwards. You may want to put the foam on top of the bouffant area as well if you can. And now I'm ready to go in the room. I'm going to confirm that I have everybody here and present, that the patient is the correct patient. I've got my respiratory therapist, my ICU nurse. I've confirmed with my physician consultant, whether it's the ICU doctor or the ED doctor, what procedures they would like, intubation lines. They're preferring the left-sided lines so that they can save the right-sided for a hemodialysis line later, and an arterial line. I've examined my patient through the glass at least, and I know that if I can use an extra long arrow perhaps, or if a regular 20 gauge arrow will suffice. I'm also writing down my anesthesia start time on a sticker before I enter the room so I don't forget. So now I'm gonna make sure that the RT has set up the ventilator and it's working and ready to go before I open and close the door quickly. Uh, I'm gonna have my kits ready as far as all the procedures and packs and gowns that I need, as well as my ultrasound uh, for the line placement and my CMAC for the intubation. Ideally, I'm gonna be in the negative pressure uh, room for intubation, um, and we're gonna maintain that intubation time as well so that they can count air cycle changes before people can enter the room again as clean. Now we're ready to go in the room, and I'm going to the head of the bed, and I'm preparing I have my drugs ready, which I've been pulled from the Pixis, um, which we are having shortages of. And I've got my CMAC over there as well. And I get ready to intubate. I push my drugs, I've changed my monitor so that I can hear uh, the pulse ox and to make sure that my blood pressure is cycling. Um, and ensured I know what drips the patient is on if they are in any pressors and we need to adjust it as I work because I will probably be in the room for the next 30 minutes to an hour. So I've communicated with everybody in the room what I'm about to do. We do a timeout, confirm the correct patient and that the identifier's consent is waived because this is an emergency. And now I'm going to get ready and I'm going to place my tube. I'm gonna do a rapid sequence intubation either with succinylcholine or rocuronium 
If I use rocuronium, the advantage is it's going to last for a long time. The patient will be paralyzed while I am doing my other procedures, which can streamline the process, and the nurse is ready with sedation medications for the patient, which have been ordered from the ICU attending. So I go ahead and I intubate, and after I intubate, the respiratory therapist can secure the tube for me while I now have to doff my gloves, being very careful to remove them and throw them. And now I'm gonna perform hand hygiene. So uh, there should be some Purell in the room and I'm gonna perform hand hygiene. And I'm gonna get ready for my central line now. And I'm going to prep their neck, whichever which side. If I wanna take a look with the ultrasound now before it's in a sterile sheath, I could, uh, just to confirm anatomy before I get started. This is where it's gonna get very hot in here. So now I'm going to open up my central line kit. And you're going to probably have to use the patient's bedside table. I'm going to open up my sterile gown and get ready for that. And I'm going to, if there's room, I'm also going to prepare my sterile gloves. You can see that things are getting really tight in a small area. And a lot of these ICU rooms are no bigger than the space I'm currently working in. And they have a lot more stuff in it. So, I've already performed hand hygiene once, correct? So now I'm putting on my gown, and I'm going to need someone else to make sure that they can secure it for you. And then I'm going to put on my second pair of sterile gloves. So now I'm ready for my central line. My line is, my patient is prepped. I have my mayo skin and my kit. I'm going to drape and follow the procedures to put my line in place. Uh, after my line is placed and the dressings and everything is in the kit, there are sterile sleeves for your saline that you can drop down. So it has everything in there that you need and more. I'm going to save some of that central line kit stuff for use in my arterial line as well. So now that my central line is complete, I'm going to take off my gown and gloves. I'm going to pop my sterile gown off, being very careful to make it inside out and inside out here as so and I'm going to roll it off inside out the best I can which we can do better if I had gone a little slower and that's going to be gone and I'm going to take this off here from the cuff sliding into the clean side as well here to put that off and that's gone and now I'm going to perform hand hygiene again this is really going to be aseptic technique now for the arterial line. I gather my materials in, in an aseptic fashion. I'm going to place my arterial line. So now I've completed all of my procedures. So at this point in time, we need to doff. So after my A-line, I've done hand hygiene again, the best I'm able. And I'm taking this portion of my sleeve down, exposing my shoulder, wrapping it around the back, and I'm taking this portion here, grabbing that sleeve to help pull it off my arm. And as you can see, I'm now rolling it off of this shoulder inwards and taking that down. And it's inside out now. And I am wrapping it up and slowly getting ready to dispose of that in the bin. I can perform hand hygiene again. So ideally I would take my pinch my glove here from the outside, grab it from underneath there, and then this one would have to slide in through the other clean side to come off. And probably go a little slower so it doesn't snap like it just did. I'm going to do hand hygiene again. I'm going to come back to the back of my head here, find that rubber strap from the face shield, pull it off my face, and now I'm going to walk outside the room. I'm going to walk outside the room now. I'm going to hang my face shield on something such like this. So I'm also going to find, take off my goggles, being careful to go as far back as I possibly could. Grab a wipe, wipe them down as soon as possible, unless there's a place to set them down for cleaning for later. And then I'm going to uh, take off my surgical mask, you know, performing hand hygiene in between each of these steps as able. And now I'm down to my N95. For our purposes, it may be easy to proceed with the following 
proceed with the Tupperware coming off and around to release it like that. And if I were to bring this and carry this in this fashion back to the call room, making sure that I've been able to set it down, perform hand hygiene before touching the machine that is the property of Dr. Karina Yu, I'm going to open the tray and I'm going to take these straps and I'm going to place the mask inside and press the button for a five minute UV sterilization mode. In theory, at the end of it, that mask would be ready to use again, or I would put it in a brown paper bag to dry out, making sure not to touch your face ever, um, possibly even with some rechargeable desiccant and reserve it for use in three to five days when the virus is dead, if there is a shortage of masks. Special thank you goes to Dr. Peter Tsai, Taiwanese American inventor of the N95 filtration material for his valuable resources and input into mask reuse. Of note, the electrostatic charge on the N95 is extremely important, so it is very important not to use bleach or alcohol wipes on your mask because it destroys the integrity of the filtration. Just to make sure everyone knows, the 0.3 micron size for filtration is important because that is the size that is most difficult to filter and despite the virus being smaller even when suspended in a droplet or not at less than 0.1 microns a 0.3 micron filter is supposed to be adequate for filtering 95 percent if not more in your average n95 look up brownie in motion Thank you so much for watching. Hope this was helpful to you. Stay safe, wash your hands. We're gonna get through this.